Hi, this is the recording to accompany the slides for the first out of two lectures on the chemical level of organization of the human body. And like always, the second slide gives you a um, overview of the lecture. So in this, what you can see is that um, in part one, we're going to talk about this items. And then the second lecture um, is going to talk about organic compounds. So what we're going to cover today is just the basics of the chemical level of organization of the human body. And then we're going to focus on inorganic compound. And like I said, the second lecture will focus on organic compounds. All right. So just to start off with, um, just some definitions of what an element is, what a compound, atom, and bond. So as you look in the diagram on the right, what you can see here are the common elements of the human body. And that would be oxygen, which makes up 65% of all the elements in the human body, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and then a whole host of other um, elements. Now, a compound is a, is a substance that's composed of two or more elements joined together by chemical bonds. So if you look in the diagram right in the middle, this is the uh, picture of water. Um, the chemical composition of water is H2O. So this is a uh, compound of water. So you've got two hydrogens over here um, and an oxygen and the um, um, out that the three different components that make up water are joined together by covalent bonds. An atom is the smallest quantity of, ele of an element with properties on it, um, properties unique to it. So that would be the oxygen. So water is again is made out of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Um, and you can see here, as I talked about, bonds before. So there, there are different types of bonds that we're going to cover in the next couple of slides. So the strongest bond is the covalent bond. So you've got covalent bonds joining the three different atoms that make up water. And then you've got weaker hydrogen bonds that actually connect different um, water um, components to each other. So over here, as I said, I'm going to talk about the different types of bonds. So you've got three different types. You've got ionic bond, hydrogen bond, and covalent bond. So an ionic bond is one that exists um, between ions of opposite charge. So what you have over here is that um, an ionic bond exists between the two atoms that make up salt, that's sodium chloride. And so you can see that the larger green circle is an atom of um, chloride and the smaller purple ones are an um, atom of uh, sodium and they are connected together by ionic bonds. Hydrogen bonds, we saw in the previous slide, are formed when you've got a weakly positive hydrogen atom that's already bond, uh, that's already bound, um, is attracted to another electronegative atom from another molecule. So as I said, this is a molecule of water. This is a second one. This is a third one. And you can see how these molecules of water, the three different molecules of water, are connected to each other by these hydrogen bonds. Right, So this hydrogen bond is a weaker connection than the covalent bond that's highlighted in the um, gray three circle um, than the covalent bond that is um, linking the hydrogen and uh, oxygen atoms in the same um, water molecule, right? So not all bonds are created uh, equal in strength. The covalent bond is the strongest, while the hydrogen bond is the weakest. So the ionic bond would be um, in between in terms of its strength um, between um, the strong covalent bond and the weaker hydrogen bond. 
when we go to the next slide, we're talking, we're going to talk about the role of energy in chemical reactions. So we talked about energy previously, how energy is released in catabolic reactions, right? Um, and um, how energy is required in anabolic reaction. So energy is um, either stored or released when bonds are broken or formed, right? So the first type of reaction is the synthesis reaction. It's also known as an anabolic reaction. And the synthesis reaction is when two or more simpler substances combine together to form a more complex substance. So we see in the diagram on the uh, right hand side that um, this is an anabolic or a synthesis reaction. As it says over here, an anabolic or synthesis reaction requires energy. And so what? that's why you have A plus B plus energy gives rise in the, in the synthesis reaction to form compound AB, which is bigger and more complex than just compound A and compound B. The second type of re reaction is a decomposition reaction. We've come across decomposition reaction and have labeled it previously as a catabolic reaction. And so in the decomposition reaction, what happens, um, as you can see over here, is that a more complex food that we eat is broken down into much simpler components, right? So what you have is you have complex compound AB is broken down into compounds A and compound B, and then energy is released as part of it. So a decomposition um, reaction um, creates um, energy. In the two diagrams uh, down below, I've labeled the one um, that has monomer 1 um, and monomer 2 are combined to, pro um, to create these um, unique monomer that's linked by covalent bonds, right? So a mono, mono means 1, right? And so you've got two monomers combined together and they form what's called a dimer. Dimer refers to two. Um, and you can see water is also released in this. Um, in the second example down below, labeled as the, the two gray triangle, you can see that these two monomers that are linked by a covalent bond, which I said before was a dimer, um, actually gets broken down into its separate monomer uh, reaction. So this one over here is an example of a synthesis reaction because a more uh, complex compound is created, whereas the one on the bottom is considered a decomposition reaction because simpler uh, compounds are created as a result of the reaction. A third type of reaction is called an exchange reaction. So an exchange reaction is when both decomposition and synthesis reactions occur simultaneously to form two new compounds. So exa an example is that when you have compounds AB and compound um, CD um, enter into a reaction, it forms two new compounds called AD and CB. So you can see that it's the AB is broken down as well as the CD, and it creates two new compounds, AD and CB. When we look at the reactions, um, there are um, names of um, the, the different components that enter into reaction. So this, in, in this reaction here, in this synthesis reaction, monomer 1 and monomer 2 are the reactants or the substrate, right? So they're, the reactants and substrates are used interchangeably. And when they enter into the reaction, they create 
these uh, this dimer, and the dimer is called the product because that's the result of the reaction. In the um, in the chemical reaction um, down below here, what happens is this dimer over here is considered the reactant or the substrate because that's the raw material that enter into the reaction. And the product, the uh, outcome of the reaction is the creation of these two monomers. So in this reaction, in this decomposition reaction, monomer one and monomer two are considered the product because that's what comes out of the reaction. So again, whether a substance is a product or a reactant depends on whether they are the raw material that goes into the reaction or whether they are the result of the reaction. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Chemical reactions um, don't occur at the same rate all the time. There are several different factors that influence the rate of chemical reaction. So the first um, overall prop, uh, factor that influences the rate of the reaction is the properties of the reactants. So the property of the substrate, right? So the, uh, the compounds that go into the start of the reaction. So the chemical reactions will occur faster when there is a larger surface area available for reactions. So for example, if you have 50, um, 50 compound A's and all those 50 compound A's are rolled into a huge ball that's composed of 50 compound A's over here, compared to if you have individual compound A's that are not lumped together into a huge ball. Now, this scenario has got a larger surface area. And so what happens is you have individual micro balls of compound A that will actually cause the chemical reaction to work faster than if you have one big huge mass of lots of compound A. So reactions occur faster when there's a larger surface area for the reactions to occur. Reactions occur faster as well when the reactants or the substrates are in a gaseous state and slowest when they are in a solid state, right? So water as, a, as, as steam will react much quicker than water as a um, as ice um, because um, there's more connection points with it, it with water being in a gaseous state. The other thing, the third thing in terms of properties is that the chemical reactions will occur faster when the reactants are smaller in size, right? So similar to the larger versus the uh, uh, smaller surface area, what happens if, they are, if the reactants are smaller in size, then it's easier for the reaction to occur because it's easier for it to get broken down or to actually make connections with the enzymes and what have you. In terms of temperatures, um, chemical reactions occur faster with higher temperatures. Although I have to say that at some point, um, the reactions stop occurring um, at all because in the human body, a lot of our reactions require the presence of enzymes to actually work. And with enzymes, they actually um, work in an optimum temperature. So if it goes any anywhere um, beyond the uh, normal range of the enzyme temperature, it stops working um, at all. In terms of the concentration, reactions occur faster with higher concentrations of reactants. So obviously, if you have more of something, more of the reactants, the reactions will occur faster. React chemical reactions also occur faster um, at higher 
pressures of the container that the reactants are in. So if you have a closed water bottle and you fill it with reactants and you apply pressure to the water bottle, then what happens is the chemical reactions in the water bottle will occur faster if the pressure inside the water bottle is higher. And then the last point is that enzymes, which are considered organic catalysts, will lower the activation energy. Um, and the definition of the activation energy is the energy that's needed to start the reaction. And um, in the presence of enzymes, what happens is that the reactions will, uh, the speed of the reactions or the rate of the reactions will increase. So if you go to the diagrams on the right, what you have is you have the progress of this reaction without an enzyme and the same reaction in the presence of an enzyme. So what you see here is you have the activation energy. So as you go up the scale, it requires more energy. So you can see that if there's no enzyme there, the reaction requires this amount of energy for it to get started. Whereas if you have um, enzymes present, then it only requires a fraction of energy required. So the way that I think about activation energy is the amount of energy that say you have to exert if you have to move a fridge, right? If it's only you moving a fridge, then you know you have to put in a lot more work, a lot more force, a lot more grunt to move the fridge. But if you have five buddies with you, and the, your buddies are the enzymes, if you have five buddies with you, you don't have to put in anywhere as much energy to actually move the fridge, right? So your buddies are like your enzyme. They speed up. The, uh, the rate of the reaction, they speed up the moving of the big fridge. So these are the, um, um, this is the basics of the chemical level of organization. The next part, we will go and talk about um, the differences between inorganic and organic compounds. And then we're going to focus the rest of the lecture on a uh, brief overview of the various most important inorganic compounds. So let's get started. When we look at organic versus inorganic compounds, what we can see here is that inorganic compounds rarely contain carbon atoms, whereas organic compounds contain at least one carbon atom. Because inorganic compound can, uh, rarely contains carbon atoms, um, they don't have carbon-carbon or carbon-hydrogen bonds, right? So these are covalent bonds that exist between two carbon atoms in the first instance, or between a carbon and a hydrogen um, atom each, right? So inorganic compounds do not have either carbon-carbon or carbon-hydrogen bonds, whereas organic compounds have at least one of these carbon-carbon or carbon-hydrogen bonds. In terms of functional groups, um, inorganic compounds don't have functional groups attached to a carbon-containing core, again, because it's rare for carbon um, to be present in inorganic compounds, and also because in an inorganic compounds are often um, small molecules. Whereas a lot of organic compounds are larger molecules and they would contain at least one 
um, functional group. And really, when you look at a lot of different um, compounds within the same group in terms of organic compounds, so I'm going to use the example of um, amino acids. So amino acids are the building blocks of um, proteins. And amino acids have a very specific um, structure to them where they have a, a carbon containing core and then each of these different amino acids has the same carbon containing core and then they have a functional group attached to the carbon containing core. And the difference between different amino acids is the difference between the functional groups um, that are attached to the carbon containing core for each different amino acid. So again, we're going to look at that when we go into the second lecture for this series. So um, having said this and having described the main differences between organic versus inorganic compounds, so we're going to go and proceed and talk about water. Water is the most abundant and most important in our inorganic uh, molecule in our body. So if you look at the diagram of the person over here that has the percentages over here, the percentages that are listed are the percentage of water that make up, say, the lungs. So if you look at the lungs over here, the lungs are made out of 75% to 80% water. Brain is made out of... Um, I can't read it, 60 to 80% water, skin, 70 to 75. So you can see here that water makes up a large components of a lot of our body tissues, body organs, body cells, right? Um, so in terms of why it's important, we have to look at the properties of water. So water is the universal solvent right? So it provides, um, it dissolves solutes, and when it dissolves solutes, it provides an environment for chemical reactions to occur. Um, in this example, in the top diagram, you've got um, a hunk uh, of uh, sodium chloride or salt. If you put um, salt into water, what happens is that the salt, the sodium chloride, will split up into its ion, ionic component. So it, the sodium chloride, instead of being one compound, will dissolve and separate out into a negatively charged chloride ion and a positively charged sodium ion. And you can see here that the sodium and the chloride are surrounded by molecules of water. Water also acts as a lubricant and a, and a cushion. So we think about cerebrospinal fluid. We think about um, the water around our heart in, in terms of the pericardial fluid. It protects against trauma and friction. We have water in our joints to stop our bones from rubbing together, right? So water is found in a lot of different places in our body to protect against trauma and friction. Water also has a high specific heat, so it acts as a heat sink. So what happens is that water can lose or gain large amounts of heat with little change in its own temperature. So it can absorb or it can release heat, and that helps our body to maintain a relatively constant body temperature, which is good for chemical reactions um, to take place. And then water is also um, used in chemical reactions. Um, it's either released as part of uh, chemical reactions or it's actually uh, incorporated into the product that comes out of the chemical reaction. So if you look at the diagram down below on the left, so we've seen this diagram before and we talked about it as being a synthesis reaction because it creates a more complex uh, product or an anabolic reaction. And what you can see over here is that water is lost, right? So you can see here H2O is incorporated into the two monomers and that's lost as part of the reaction. And when water is lost, it's called a dehydration reaction, right? 
hydro refers to water, D refers to removal, right? So this reaction is called a dehydration synthesis reaction or an anabolic reaction. In the second diagram in the bottom right, what we see here is this, we um, have seen this reaction in this diagram before. We called it a decomposition reaction or a catabolic reaction. Um, but in this, um, with a reference point of water, because water is used as one of, um, to create this, uh, the products and what happens is water is split up so instead of you, you having H2O what happens is water is split right into OH which connects with one of the products and an H which creates with the second product this is called a hydrolysis reaction as well lysis means to break up and hydro refers to water. So a uh, hydrolysis reaction is one that water is broken down into smaller components. The next, um, so this is, slide talks about the importance of water, but how water is the most ab abundant um, um, compound in our body. Um, and then you can see here just the di distribution of water in our body organs and tissues. Um, what I'm going to talk now is where exactly is this water found in terms of um, at the cellular level. So when we talk about compartments that contain water at the cellular comp uh, level, we can either talk about water as being inside the cell in the, which case it would be considered intra, intra means inside, cellular fluid, right? So inside the cell or outside the cell. So outs, water that's found outside the cell is called extracellular fluid. So extra means extra outside the cell. So extracellular fluid is water found outside the cell. If you look at the diagram at the, at the top, the pie chart, what you can see here is most of the water, over 50% of the water, is found outside the, sorry, inside the cell. And out of the water that's found outside the cell, so um, I'm going to change color ink. So this, this, this fluid are extracellular fluid, so water found outside the cell. And you can see that out of the extracellular fluid, a large component is found in between cells. So the, the water that's found in between cells is called interstitial fluid. So you can see here, this is interstitial fluid, right? They're not found inside the cells. They're found in between the cells. Right, so all this is inter interstitial fluid. And then um, another large component, although not as large as interstitial fluid, is found inside the blood vessels, right? So plasma is the fluid component of blood, um, and plasma um, consists of 20% of the total water volume in the body. Right? So you've got here just where fluid is found um, as, as it pertains to cells. So you can see a large amount of fluid is found inside the cell um, with um, less found outside the cell, extracellular fluid. And out of the, the water that's found outside the cell, a large component of that is interstitial fluid. Um, in terms of what the water um, looks like, the composition of the water inside the body, what happens is that the water that's found outside the cell have got similar composition with each other compared to the water that's found inside the cell. So if you look at the diagram on the top right, what you can see here is that these beige color um, bars indicate the amount of these different 
components inside the cell. So if you look at this, what you can see here is inside the cell, compared to the water outside the cell, which is uh, indicated by either blue bar to indicate interstitial fluid or red bars to indicate plasma, what you can see here is that when we look at sodium, we can see that most sodium is found outside the cell. Most chloride in the body is found outside the cell, right? Um, you've got very little chloride found inside the cell and very little sodium found inside the cell. When we look at the levels of potassium, we can see that most of the body's potassium is found inside the cell. Most of the body's phosphate is found inside the cell. Most of the body's magnesium as well as proteins are found inside the cell, right? So when we look at the main differences between extracellular fluid, that is interstitial fluid and plasma, what we can see um, is that um, there are slightly more ions in blood compared to interstitial fluid. And when we look at the protein anions, what you can see is that there are proteins both in blood as well as inside the cell and not very much in the interstitial fluid, right? So you can see there's hardly any proteins found in the fluid that's in between cells. When we compare the levels of various ions in the extracellular fluid compared to intracellular fluid, again, acknowledging that with the exception of proteins, you can see that the levels of ions in the interstitial fluid and plasma are very similar to each other, right? So when we look at sodium, what we can see is sodium, there is a higher level of sodium in the ECF, in the extracellular fluid, right, over here. There is more um, potassium There's more potassium in the intracellular fluid. When we look at bicarb, we can see that there's more bicarb in the extracellular fluid over here. If we look at chloride ions, we can see that there's a higher concentration again in the extracellular fluid. And when we look at protein anions, we can see that there's a large concentration in the intracellular fluid, right? Um, and so what happens is that it's this differences need to be maintained across all the different ions need to be maintained between the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid because that helps the body function um, in a uh, efficient manner. And um, there is a, um, a mechanism that basically ensures that sodium is kept outside the cells and potassium is kept inside the cells. And that mechanism is called the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. We will look at the sodium-potassium uh, ATPase pump in a couple of lectures down the road. So I don't want to give, give away the, uh, the surprise there. Just note that the sodium-potassium ATPase pump is crucial in maintaining the levels of sodium and potassium in intracellular fluid versus extracellular fluid. When we look at, um, so I've talked about ions, I've talked about um, solutes and solvents. So what I thought I'd do is just give you a brief overview just to define these terms that I've used. Right? So solutes are substances that are dissolved in a solution. So when we look at this, you've got a crystal of, uh, um, of uh, um, sodium chloride or salt that's dissolved in water. So what you have is you, so this example is sodium chloride or salt that's dissolved in water. 
And when we look at sodium chloride being dissolved in water, what happens is water then is considered the solvent. So the solvent is a solution that solids are dis dissolved in. Right? Um, a salt is a substance that's composed of an anion, which is a negatively charged uh, substance, atom, and at least one cation. A cation is considered a positively charged uh, substance over here. So an example of a salt is salt or sodium chloride. Some salts are electrolytes. Some salts do conduct electrical activity. So sodium chloride is one of those salts that do con conduct electrical activity. So they are considered an electrolyte. And when we talk about the components that make up salt, what happens is it's composed of a positively charged sodium. So that would be considered a cation and a negatively charged chloride. So that would be considered an anion, right? So um, an overall category for um, cations and anions is considered so Ions include both cations, which are positively charged ions, as well as anions, which are negatively charged ions. And then uh, uh, another type of um, compound that is found in fluid compartments are acids and bases. So an acid, if you look in seven, is described as a substance that dissolves into hydrogen, and whatever the anion is in water, right? An acidic uh, solution has a pH of less than seven um, in water. A basic solution or a base is a substance that dissociates into hydroxyl OH negative ions, as well as its component cations in water. A basic solution has a pH of over more than seven, right? And that really brings us to the concept of a pH. Um, I'm going to elaborate on uh, pH because we talked about acid and bases. So pH is a relative measure of how acidic and or how basic or alkalinic a solution is. Right, so water with a pH of seven is considered neutral, and as I said, if water has a pH of less than seven, it's considered acidic, whereas water with a pH of greater than seven is considered basic. Right, so this is neutral, anything above it is considered basic. Anything below it is considered acidic. So that's what you've learned in high school chemistry. When we talk about blood, however, the normal range of blood is 7.35 to 7.45. So you can see that the normal range of blood is slightly basic compared to water, right? So if you have blood with a pH of 7.35 and uh, um, between the pHs of 7.35 and 7.45, it's considered within the normal range. Whereas if it drops below 7.35, it's considered acidic. If it increases more than 7.45, it's considered basic or alkalinic, right? So this is it. When you have pH of 7, pH of 7 is considered neutral in water, but if you have blood with a pH of 7, it's considered acidic, right? Because it's below the 7.35. If you have water with a pH of 7.45, it's considered basic. But if you have blood with a pH of 7.25, again, because it's less than 7.35, it's considered acidic, right? If you have 
Um, water that's got a pH of 7.4, um, it's considered basic, right? Because that follows this rule here. But if you have blood that has a pH of 7.45, because it's within this normal range, it's considered normal in blood, right? So again, we're going to talk about pHs as we continue on um, in further lectures. Now, because blood has a very specific range that it needs to stay in, there is uh, the presence of something called a buffer that helps to minimize or neutralize small amounts, uh, swings in small amounts of, uh, of pHs, right? So a buffer is a, a solution of a weak acid and its conjugate base, which can neutralize small amounts of acid or bases in bodily fluids. Doesn't prevent the change in pH, but helps to minimize uh, large swings in the pH. Buffer pairs are, are, are present both outside the cell in plasma or inside and inside the cell in order to help to maintain blood um, and, and the fluid within its normal range. So what I'm going to do is go through a scenario where you have um, the effects of buffer or not on a solution. So if you have a solution and acid is added to the solution, what happens is that if there is no buffer in the solution, the pH will decrease quite substantially. Whereas if there is a buffer, if the solution has a buffer, it will decrease a little bit, but not as much, right? So not as much change compared to a solution with no buffer. If we add a strong base to a solution, what happens is if there is no buffer, the pH of that solution will increase quite dramatically, whereas in the presence of a buffer, it will increase, but not as much, right? So not as much change compared to with no buffer. Again, when a strong acid is added to a solution, pH will drop if there's no buffer there, but in the presence of the buffer, what happens, it will drop, but a little bit, but not as much change as with no buffer, right? So what happens is the presence of the buffer helps to minimize the drastic changes that could occur compared to if there was no buffer there. And then I'm going to end up with a... Uh, um, just a couple of other important inorganic molecules, that is oxygen as well as CO2. So oxygen and CO2, oxygen is used in cellular respiration, CO carbon dioxide or CO2 is produced as a result of, of cellular reaction, right? So as it says over here, oxygen is required to com to uh, complete decomposition reactions can cause the release or production of energy in the body, whereas carbon dioxide is produced as a waste product. So if you take the pH of blood coming from the cells, venous blood, it's often more acidic as with a lower pH than blood going to the cells. Carbon dioxide also helps to maintain appropriate acid-base balance in the body. And we'll talk about that more later as we continue on with uh, human anatomy and physiology. But if you look over here, you can see that there's a reaction where you can see that carbon dioxide um, with the help of an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase um, is reversibly um, transformed into carbonic acid, which then breaks down into bicarbonate and its hydrogen ion. So basically, if you have a lot of carbon dioxide 
in your system, that would also increase the amount of hydrogen ions in your system. And when you have an increase in hydrogen ions, what happens is the pH goes down, right? And again, we're going to talk more about this as we continue on in human anatomy and physiology. But on this note, I'm going to leave it and hope that you've had enough. Thank you. Bye.